I'm getting to go to Swinburne to see some physical testing. As you can see, we've made it to Swinburne University and we're in the structural testing lab that we can see behind us and we'll see some shots of this. It's a really impressive lab with an amazing mass system that allows for fixed six degrees of freedom. So they can test in six degrees to see how the elements are actually behaving. We'll actually see a test in progress here, which will be quite exciting. We're also here with Jerry, which will introduce some of his stuff here. Hi, Jerry. Hey, guys. And this is actually for his PhD research. Jerry's research is focused on the efficient design of wind turbine structures, primarily these thin walled tube structures at the base, as there's not a lot known about them, especially the numerical models of them and how we can actually assess them accurately so it can lead to more efficient designs. And Swinburne's testing lab is uniquely designed to test these type of structures with their six degrees of freedom mass system. So basically this represents only the very bottom section of a wind turbine tower. Yes. Uh, everything up there, including the rotors, uh, the nacelle, all of that is being modeled numerically. Yes. So the first cycle test that we do allows us to get a, a, a baseline performance of the structure here that we can then use to uh, configure a, a test protocol for the second specimen. Yes. Now the second specimen will have ground motion input from X and Y yes. concurrently. They're using a real ground motion record. So it's pretty wide. Yes. Uh, that much and uh, you see it's completely teared. Yeah. These are just for the cross correlation. So, so you can I actually can... put it into the computer and get a proper Yeah, so I can show you a little bit on the screen here. So uh, right now, that's for the second one. We have essentially four cameras. They're mounted on the aluminum extrusion there. Yes. Uh, they basically allow us to generate, uh, to visually capture the strain field of uh, what may be about, I don't know, 130 degrees. Yes. Field of view around the specimen. That's really cool. Uh, yeah. We'll directly uh, communicate with Simulink here. Uh, the reason we're using Simulink is because we want to have this um, real-time machine uh, in between the system that can generate command signals at 1024 hertz. The open seas are solving at a, a particular step time. Yes. We don't want that signal to be directly sent to the actuators because what might happen is the actuator might just get to that level, hold, and then wait until the next one. And yes. that could cause some relaxation, force relaxation yes. in between. So we want to have a continuous and smooth movement. Uh, that's what's being controlled by this uh, Simulink model here. What this does, it, it uses essentially a polynomial uh, to make prediction of the next step based on the past couple of steps while it's waiting for the data feedback to come back. Uh, once, it's, once the next step is calculated, uh, it then converts from a prediction into a correction, and it actually moves uh, using a different polynomial yes. to the next point. So it ensures that everything, relatively speaking, is in a pretty smooth pattern. That's what the uh, XPC target machine does, and that will directly communicate with the actual hydraulic controllers. So there is a fiber optics memory, a scram that card, between this computer and the actual hydraulic computer. To make it as fast as possible. Yeah, yeah, to make sure there's minimum delay. There's some computation done as well, because you can see that we have actually eight actuators here. We have two for X, two for Y, and four for Z, uh, but we're controlling it in six degrees of freedom. So it's, in a sense, we need to do some uh, transformation to get that actuals, eight actuator control into a six DOF control. And so that all happens over there. We are subjecting this particular specimen here uh, to the same uh, ground set of ground motions, but in increased uh, intensity. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and so we're hoping to use uh, those data uh, to do some fragility analysis. So I'm going to just run a very uh, small trial test. What I'm 
going to do now is essentially a, a pure numerical simulation. We're not going to actuate anything just or read from the just feedback. Just to make sure that OpenSeas is producing yeah, good results. Yeah, uh, and just to make sure that the communication uh, is, uh, is working correctly. Yeah, you wouldn't want to start the test. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, there's one last thing that I want to check. Uh, we'll see yeah. there was a pretty linear, a very gradual application of that gravity load. Yes. Uh, we do that first before we start to um, do any kind of uh, um, actual controls. Uh, so right now, this scope is looking at the commands, uh, displacement commands being sent to the controller. Um, we actually have a mixed model control. So we have the displacement in the X and Y. Uh, so control here. Uh, we also have a rotation about x-axis, about y-axis controlled directly as well. Uh, in the actual z-axis, we're doing it in force control because the, the force is relatively small yeah. and the, the axial stiffness is quite high. So that means the displacement is very minimal. It's very minimal. It's, yeah. it's going to be very hard to control precisely with the displacement feedback loop. Um, with regards to the rotation, we're just controlling it uh, fixing it at, at zero here. Yeah. Uh, so right now, when we're looking at the scope 11 and 14, so these are two represent, different representations of the force feedback, uh, sorry, the displacement feedback, and these two are the force feedback, because we right now the hydraulics are not actually connected. These are just uh, reading whatever uh, that screen is producing. And um, this tells us that the scrap net, the communication fiber optics, it's working okay. And it looks like the actual control is doing okay as well. So I'm just going yeah. to be running those. So you're just, you're just checking to make sure it's also smooth. Is that the... It's really just, you know, if this is moving or not. Uh, <laughs> if it doesn't move, you're in trouble. <laughs> well, yes, yes, essentially, yeah. 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 Yeah, so the actual ground motion, because we have the experiment uh, um, scaled down, um, so we have to apply uh, what's called the similitude law to adjust everything, uh, including the actual uh, time. Um, yes. And we're, we're fixing the acceleration or fixing fixing the, uh, the material properties like the Young's modulus. Uh, so there is essentially some time scale changes as well that needs to be applied to make sure that you know, what we are doing here on the small scale experiment is representative yeah. of Essentially, the ground motion that we have, we reduces it from 17 seconds down to around 10 seconds ish. Uh, and then we apply the artificial damping that sort of stops uh, the first stage of ground motion testing before yes. we start the next higher amplitude one. Um, so, in the uh, computation space, that whole process is 12 seconds per simulation. Yes. Uh, but we're going to start to have uh, each step here is going to take much longer uh, on here uh, in, in the real world. Yes. Uh, and so effectively that 12 second of simulation in the computer is being stretched out uh, to around half an hour for yes. the first two levels. And to ensure good stability, we're actually having smaller time steps for the subsequent um, periods, in, yeah. yeah, intensities, and so that means the, the test will be stretched to one hour for yes. each, each each time step. Yeah. Level. So overall, it's about four hours. Yes. We're waiting for the test setup to get going. I want to explore some of the other unique things that Spoonbrand has to offer, and this was their concrete printing lab. So I'm Brendan, by the way. As well. Yeah. Yeah. Nice to see you. So you're the lab manager here. Yes. Or? Yes. Looks like you'll have some interesting stuff coming out, yeah. especially the shapes. Mold. You yeah. can see that one. It can be used for facade, different shape. Yes. This one, that one. How much? How much are you reducing it by? Is it completely? Uh, totally, we We, do, we, do, so we are zero. not using any cement yet. Yeah. Instead of cement, we're using the fly ash with some uh, other chemical uh, as an actu actuator. Yes. So uh, this material can uh, can work the same as cement. Yeah. And is it the same strength or the is it the same strength? Yeah. yeah. That one is a robot, and we want uh, we we want it like a. Uh, Set up this one beside this, which yes. is when we print, that one can shape the surface for four separate like a section. Yes. And um, then it just comes together. Yes, then they put it together and it's, uh, in the middle they put the fireplace. Yes. 
was very nice. Everything bonded to each other. It, yes, that is the yeah. There's no line. So uh, we have a number of PhD students. They are working on the uh, property of the material. Yes. How we can, okay, so they're doing both the from, from an architectural perspective and, and a structural perspective as well. They yes. can do both. Yeah, exactly. So as you can see, this one is very thin layer of the concrete. Yeah. We added some. Uh, we added some. Um, uh, so it's a small uh, aggregate, or is it uh, like it's, silicon? No, no, it's, a, it's a small aggregate. Yeah. But we add some fiber inside yes. that. To, fiber to, cement. Yeah, mm, it can be metal fiber or glass fiber. Yes. Yeah, to increase the strength, because uh, by itself that one will definitely will break. <laughs> so, so you can see that that one is a metal fiber inside yes. that. Yes. So it becomes more like a fiber, a structural fiber slab. Uh, Add fiber to make reinforce the concrete. Yes. As you know, in the concrete usually like this, you put some real bar inside yes. that. In this system, we are not able to add uh, bar. Yes. So we add this uh, material, the fiber inside that, to make it a strong. To make it super strong. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Also, we have some other machine. We can. We have a flexible mold. That yes. means we can print the concrete, then change the change mold, the shape, shape as you. Oh, so you print it flat, then yes. bend it after the fact. Yes. So, so you think eventually we'll have a full 3D printed house? Well, we have some uh, company in Australia. They work on it. Yeah. Oh, Terence. Terence. So you're all part of the lab technician to help with all these. Uh, systems. I'm a test engineer working at the university. Yeah. So do you do any PhDs, or is it just with the testing and helping the PhD students? Ah, uh, no, I'm. Uh, a uh, bachelor's degree a couple of years ago, um, and I just went straight into the workforce after that point. So I basically work entirely in um, the support elements around the lab, setting up testing, running testing, designing fixtures, um, uh, basically um, start to end the whole pipeline. Yep. So you get to learn a lot, especially yes, yes. a lot of testing. And yes, very much. You um, uh, learn a lot of different technologies. And twice as many because half of them, half of them break. Half of yep. them break. And they cost $10 a unit. Yeah. So you Hundreds of dollars at it. It just opens up a, a really broad range um, of research that, that can be done uh, with new materials, uh, new designs. Yes. Um, and, and one of the key features of this particular setup is that we, are, we can test things all the way to collapse uh, in, in a pretty controlled manner. That is something that cannot be done on traditional shape tables because when you build such a large scale, it becomes a safety concern. 